Our guest on This is America and the World is U.S. Congressman David Trone. He's a Democrat representing the 6th Congressional District of Maryland, and he's the co-chair, along with Senator Tom Cotton, of the Commission on Combating Synthetic Opioid Trafficking. We'll talk about opioids and abuse in America. Congressman Trone, thank you so much for being with us. Great to be here today. Thanks for having us. Uh, we're going to get serious in this conversation. We're going to talk about opioids and deaths from opioid addiction or disorder, use disorder, as they call it nowadays. What, what kind of numbers are we dealing with as far as opioid deaths in America over the last year and maybe over the last 10, 12 years? Well, the numbers are pretty catastrophic. Uh, the last 12 months rolling, it's over 100,000 deaths of overdoses, of which that is the vast majority of those are fentanyl, uh, is where the opioid deaths are taking place now. But what's really scary is this has been going on since the late 90s when we had the Oxycontin and the Sackler family. We went to heroin, we went to meth, we've been to coke, and now we're in fentanyl. Overall, opioid deaths are over a million or overdose deaths, over a million deaths now uh, in those 20 year period. And we still haven't taken uh, big time measures here to stem this uh, casualty rate. It's a difficult proposition, I gather, because to manufacture synthetic opioids is, is, is not a difficult proposition, huh? No, it's really quite easy. And at one point the fentanyl was coming from China and now China's supplying the precursors and the pre to the precursors. But the cartels in Mexico, uh, two in particular, are making virtually 100% of the fentanyl. It's easy to make in a small lab, can be hidden very easily. And the other key point is that it's so powerful. It's over 50 times more powerful than any of the other opioids that are out there. So it can be brought across the border in very small amounts. Uh, with devastating consequences. So the trafficking of uh, this uh, synthetic uh, opioid, uh, fairly small amounts can come across in, in person, I gather, but also through the mails or delivery systems, uh, mail delivery systems. It's, it's kind of scary, Dennis, that literally, uh, I like to use as a prop uh, a little pack of sweet and low. This pack of sweet and low uh, contains, if it had fentanyl, enough to kill 500 Americans, 500. So when you think about how much actually comes into the US, it's between three and five tons a year. You could take literally two pickup trucks, overload them a little bit, drive those two trucks across the border, and that's, there's 73 million cars crossing that border. So it's a needle in a haystack. It's a, a dot of sand on a beach. How do we find those two pickup trucks out of 73 million cars? And the Mexican government has largely decided that this is too dangerous of a path to prosecute and push against the cartels. And they've adopted a, a plan of hugs, literally hugs not bullets, because the previous in, uh, uh, previous folks in Mexico before President Obrador tried to take on the cartels, but the cartels are so powerful and the size of their business is almost one third of the Mexican gross domestic product. So a third of the economy controlled by the cartels, hundreds of billions of dollars, corruption with money, violence, 36,000 Mexicans were murdered last year with less than a 1% solve rate. Nobody solves crimes and politicians are being murdered. Over a hundred politicians running for office like Congress mm -hmm. were murdered. So the options of corruption, the violence or hugs, not bullets, is what they've adopted. And that's, that means we've got a real problem. We're not gonna stop supply. 
We've got to move our focus to demand. Ah, you put your finger on it. Supply, demand. <clears throat> right now, as we are talking, how many people do you think are using these opioids now illegally? Yep. Yeah. And that's one of the biggest issues that we highlight in the report is we don't really know that. You know, we don't have good data and we don't have current data. Think about how the COVID data evolved on how many folks were hospitalized, how many folks were in ICU units, how many folks died. At first, that data was very hard to come by and then we got it. And now we have very much up to date data on COVID, but we don't have that on the opioid addiction area. So that's one of the things that a report calls for is collection of data that's real time so we can get a handle on, you know, how many folks are in active addiction, but literally an addict that's on fentanyl will generally take it about three times a day because it's fairly fast acting. And to fill their, to fill their need, it's again, back to this packet, it's two packets for the entire year. That's all they need for the entire year. They're good. And that's what's so dangerous about this. It's so powerful. And of course, now what's happening is it's getting into other drugs. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, let's hold on that note. You've mentioned report a couple of times, uh, Congressman. Want to pick that up on the other side, take a little break talking with uh, Congressman David Trone. He represents the 6th uh, Congressional District in the great state of Maryland. Uh, a huge report uh, to talk about on the other side. This is America and the World. Underwriting for This is America and the World is made possible by the Japan America Society of Washington, D.C., the Republic of Uzbekistan. The Sultanate of Oman. The Kingdom of Morocco. The National Association for Children of Addiction. Faces and Voices of Recovery. The Forerunner Foundation. The Rotondaro Family Trust and the Embassy Series, Uniting People Through Musical Diplomacy. Congressman, you and uh, Senator Tom Cotton, co-chairs, and uh, have just put together co-chairs of a huge commission and a report that has just come out on the trafficking of these uh, synthetic opioids. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the report, how long in the making, who was involved, and what are the headlines, huh? Well, the report was over a year in the making, and the key tenet when we started the report was, how are we gonna get something that's bipartisan? And the only way we're gonna get something done in this toxic culture that we have here in Washington is that we can find some things that we can agree on, and then we can execute and get them done. So I commend it from a business background and working bipartisan is, you know, how I've always worked successfully. So the commission's composed of myself and Senator Ed Markey on the Democrat side, Congressman Fred Upton and Senator Cotton, and he and I are the co-chairs. Then we have four outside experts, which really were a huge win to the report. And then all seven key government agencies, Department of Defense, DEA, ONDCP, State, Treasury, so it's an all of government effort to uh, take a look at this and come up with some actionable, and we have 76 actionable steps that we can take, turn them into executive action and legislative action. But if we don't really utilize this and turn it, it's gonna be sitting on a shelf. And that's not why I came to Congress. It's not why Tom Cotton came to the Senate. You know, we both are here to get some stuff done. And that's where this report is gonna be the roadmap to happening. So the um, if you looked at some headlines in the report, as far as the challenges and the uh, new ways of going about stopping the trafficking of these drugs, 
what comes to mind that we should know about? I mean, when you hold up the little packet of the sweet and low, or you say you could put all of the drugs in a couple of small vans and drive, how do you even begin? And when you have Mexico that's taken a, a, a position that is not helpful at all by any stretch of the imagination, how do you stop the flow of these uh, drugs, and especially the, the fentanyl, which is so powerful and is a real killer? Uh, Dennis, it's a, a couple of key takeaways. And the first one, just what you hit on, we cannot stop the supply side. We can disrupt it, and we should. We can try and slow things down, but it's coming back. We're not going to stop it. The second piece to take away is- Not going to stop week, it, not going to stop it. Not going to stop it. Okay. Not going to stop it. Second piece, this is becoming so much more dangerous for all Americans because the cartels are entrepreneurs and they realize that Americans don't like injecting a drug like heroin. We don't really like smoking a drug like meth. But what Americans do is we take pills. We're comfortable with pills. So they've changed their delivery method from needles, smoking to pills. And that's really what makes this so dangerous because now they're using counterfeit pills made in their pill, pill making presses in Mexico or the US and they are counterfeiting Oxycontin, Adderall, Xanax, Valium, all these pills that folks might pick up at a weekend party and say, hey, I used to take the Xanax once in a while. But if it has just two grains of fentanyl, they're at risk of a deadly overdose. And that's what's going to allow this crisis to expand at an ever increasing rate because the Mexicans' ingenuity for more profits, more billions of dollars of profits, has moved into this very efficient delivery method with pills that the American consumers are comfortable with, and it's disguised in these counterfeits. So, uh, Congressman, I'm a recovering alcoholic, you know, so, so that's fair game and that's knowledge. So I, I, I know about that piece of the pie. The whole idea behind addictions is kill the pain and feel good. So if you can't stop the drugs coming in, you've got to take a look at the demand for these drugs in the United States. What's going on? What have you put your finger on to help us understand that piece of the pie? Yeah, now Dennis, yeah, it hit the most important takeaway. And we talked about can't stop it, it's getting worse, but the demand is where we've got to move. And that was the number one takeaway from the report. And that's what most of these 76 recommendations deal with, how we can educate folks about the dangers of these counterfeit tablets, understanding addiction, how we can do medical research. We do a lot of research from the neck down, but the lack of research for mental health and addiction, it's very, very underfunded. We've got to get money to NIDA, get money to SAMHSA, do more medical research to understand how these drugs work in our brain. Then we've got to work on treatment, MAT, medically assisted treatment, We've got a lot of really prohibitive things that slow that down. We know it works. We've got to open up folks to be able to prescribe these MAT, these drugs. We've got to look at housing, recovery housing. When a, my nephew died of a fentanyl overdose at 24. So, and you know, that's why I got involved in this. And, you know, he had tried hard for over five years to come clean and had made great progress. And then all of a sudden, the holiday season slipped back. But housing is so key to live in a sober housing environment around folks that carry your same values of recovery. So we've got inconsistent regulations and rules on the US on our 28 day programs, our transition housing, our recovery housing. So there's a whole myriad of things. This, as you said, it's so complicated, it takes a hundred different things to get the demand side tamped down. And we can make real progress here and we can save tens of thousands of lives, but we got to get started. 
There was an article in the Post recently, uh, a long uh, feature article about Dr. Fauci. And uh, apart from the conversations that he had with the reporter, it was an excellent piece uh, about COVID and about threats to him and his family. There were a couple of times in the article where he said there's something going on in the country that I can't put my finger on that's causing people to have a more difficult time uh, handling the pandemic. I, I think I'm not taking him out of context. So I'm going to apply that to our conversation. Uh, if you have people who, there was an article in the New York Times where some people who were opioid addicts in recovery talked about the feeling of using these synthetic opioids as the feeling of love. Would you think that a lot of the use is because we have a lot of unhappy people who underneath maybe have depression, anxieties, and trauma that has not even been dealt with? So exposing them to these drugs and then use, abuse, you cross the line, you're off and running. Uh, you're absolutely right on track, and we cannot and will never solve the addiction crisis without directly addressing the mental health crisis in America. With COVID, we've exacerbated both the anxiety that we all feel because of COVID, the pressure that many of us feel because of COVID. So we've got to connect these two pieces together. In the House of Representatives, we put together a team. We've got a bipartisan I stress that word is the key, mm -hmm. caucus on addiction and mental health together. And we've come up with over 70 pieces of legislation, everyone bipartisan, and we're working now to drive those through the Energy and Commerce Commission, where most all of them will land, a few through judiciary. And on the Senate side, Senator Patty Murray and her counterpart on the Republican side, Burr, are working to drive similar type of legislation through. So together, you know, we can get these across the finish line. And the White House, I've spoken to President Biden, he is absolutely committed to the addiction crisis, the mental health crisis. His family, we all know, has struggled with those areas. Mm -hmm. And so we've got the stages set as COVID begins to become unfortunately normalized with more and more vaccinations more therapeutics that are very successful. You know, we're gonna move to a time when it's, we need to turn to something we can seize on, mental health and addiction together, bipartisan, and give this country some wins. And instead of giving this country all the back and forth and the, the craziness and the bickering that we see. Because, um, you know, uh, you referenced uh, your nephew uh, a little earlier, uh, Ian. So at 25 years of old, uh, age, uh, all of a sudden, the family is presented with this horrible crisis, this, this horrible news. Uh, so the effect on families for article in the Post uh, recently uh, 10 DC opioid overdoses in just hours. Three of them died. Three yeah. of them died. And I think the rest of them ended up in the hospital. So it's affecting families big time. Well, all addictions affect families hugely. And then nice. w one of the things we haven't even talked about is the effect on the economy of the country. No, I, I saw that article and it was devastating. And, and this is another bad batch of a drug which was over, overcut. It takes two milligrams for dead. And the average, mil average dose of delivery is 1.8. So if someone doesn't measure properly, we have, a, we have a fatality. And that's what we had in Washington in that batch. And your other point is we got to quit looking at these numbers and, and say 100,000 a million in 20 years. We got to think about, as you said, the families, the wives, 
the husbands, the sons, the daughters that all had a name like Ian. And that's what we got to get around that effect on all of us. And then you mentioned the economy. I mean, the Council of Economic Report in 2018 pegged the number of 696 billion. You extrapolate that to the deaths that we have now, it's over a trillion dollars a year against our economy. A trillion dollars of cost, 100,000 dead, and the families grieving, it's incalculable. So here's, here's, here's where I'm going, and, and, and I wanna get this out. So, so there was a bad batch in Southwest Washington where 10 people overdosed. It was a bad batch. So somebody's at a party and they are offered some stamped Oxycontin pills, huh? Yep. They don't know what they're getting, huh? They don't know. And it's if somebody cut it wrong in the lab, that could be a death. That could be a death, that is, right? That is exactly what's happening. Uh, the cartels are not good at measuring. Uh, they don't have... That's a, that's, and, a, that's a very interesting slogan. The cartels are not good at measuring because you don't know what you're getting. That's the, oh, it, that's the is that the message? That, you don't know what that, you're that, getting? That's exactly the message for our kids that are in their 20s and 30s and 40s. And, you know, you don't know what you're getting and you have to assume there is fentanyl in it if you did not get it from a pharmacy. You, it's very likely counterfeit. They look identical, absolutely identical. The color, the stamping, there's no way you can tell them apart. And two little great grains of fentanyl and potentially dead. So again, Congressman, um, part of the messaging is if you didn't get it from the pharmacy, you don't know yeah. what's in it. And it may be fentanyl and it could kill you. Absolutely, and that's part of this prevention piece that we've got to get that word out because so many people in their 20s and 30s are think about that recreational drug, that Xanax, that used to be okay. Yeah. And they're dead. How do you get that messaging out? Um, where's the budget for those PSAs? Where's the well, budget for those hearings with an array of people who are well-known, formerly opioid addicts, making a presentation to the country. And to really get this surface, we've got to eliminate the stigma, the stigma of addiction, the stigma of mental health, and we've got to get an all of community and all of government effort and get these type of folks in front of members of Congress and in industry to stand up and speak about it and the executive branch to talk about it. And together, the PSA dollars, we're losing a trillion dollars a year. I sit on the Appropriations Committee. Uh, we can certainly appropriate a significant amount of money on PS, PSA type announcements uh, to alert the entire country of this danger. We can work with our friends at the DEA they got a great hardworking folks there and use that group uh, with their leadership to drive this forward. Uh, and we also need a centralized voice in Washington. The report's recommended we take the head of the Office of National Drug Control Policy, Dr. Raul Gupta, and be elevated that to a cabinet post. It was a cabinet post through 2008, from 1993 to 2008, then for whatever reason, it was taken out. And when you'll note, and it's not connected directly, but the year it was taken out in 09, it's like an L-shaped increase on deaths, mm. on overdoses. Mm. Mm. So Congressman, quite... we're at the end of our time. We're at the end of our time. Uh, I wrote down the word stigma, you know, as something that has to be attacked. Uh, I wrote down in your words, we're in an addiction crisis, a mental health crisis. Um, all I can say is I support you on your work. 
Uh, congratulations to you and Senator Cotton and all the people who were involved in putting the report together. And uh, just know that uh, I'm on your team, so whatever I can do, uh, please uh, know that the invitation is there. Thank you so much, Congressman. Just a terrific conversation. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. And shame on us if we don't move the ball forward. Uh, we're better than what we've been, and we owe it to America. So thank you. Thank you, Congressman. For information about This Is America and the World, visit our website, thisisamerica.net, or our YouTube channel, This Is America TV, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Underwriting for This Is America and the World is made possible by the Japan America Society of Washington, D.C., the Republic of Uzbekistan, the Sultanate of Oman, the Kingdom of Morocco, the National Association for Children of Addiction, Faces and Voices of Recovery, the Forerunner Foundation, the Rotondaro Family Trust, and the Embassy Series, Uniting People Through Musical Diplomacy.